Hello there, welcome back to The Closet Historian and back to my sewing room for another project today. Now technically this is a modification I have shown you all here on the channel before, but it was in my kind of very first sewing tutorial-ish sort of video and there's some questionable filming practices and makeup looks going on in that video, so I thought today I would show you the same modification again um, and try and uh, do so with a little bit more clarity and also my top-down camera view that I have now, just kind of really clear up the process perhaps a little bit and also just redeem myself from that wild look I had going on at the various points in that video, honestly. Here are some vintage examples of this pattern modification I'll be showing you today where you take the dart fullness and use that dart fullness, move it up into the neckline and use it as gathering instead. So it was something that was used in the 1930s and 40s quite a lot. So it's a very useful pattern modification to have in your arsenal. And I actually really like the resulting look. And I have a couple of blouses that use this same modification. I've used it for a couple of dresses now. So today I'll be using a bug print cotton poplin. No surprise there. We all know how I like bug jewelry and bug prints and don't and like actually I'm afraid of actual bugs, but you know, I'm working on it through exposure therapy. This is actually a very simple modification or change to make to any darted front bodice pattern. So let's jump on over to the blue patterning table of doom and get started. Here I have my design for today, just a simple little A-line dress with this detail up at the neckline. So I have a tracing of my all-in-one sleeve bodice block here, the front of that, with its waist dart. I'm going to Line up one of the dart legs and continue it on all the way up to the apex. It doesn't matter which dart leg you choose for this. I'm just going to make sure it extends all the way up to the apex. And then I'm going to draw um, a line from the apex up to the neckline. I'm going to intersperse that into three places here. Um, before, I think I've shown you can do this with just one dart up here if you want. But it is kind of nice to distribute the fullness up here along the neckline if you want to have gathering all along the neckline. So that's what I'm going to do here. And here I am going over the neckline, not thinking that I need to lower it a half inch. But I definitely should have because I'm going to be adding a bias binding up here at the neckline instead of a facing. Um, that's just how I'm going to finish mine today. I should have lowered that before I did this modification up here. I should have lowered it a half inch because, of course, there's seam allowance on my block pattern that I will not need. And it will result in my neckline being a little too high on this dress, which is something I ended up fixing off camera. But I just want to mention it here to if you are going to finish your neckline the way I am with binding today, you do need to cut off that extra seam allowance up there that I forget to do here. But otherwise, this pattern modification is the same. So if you were to finish this with a facing, this uh, would be how you would do it. Um, but because I finished mine with binding later, I should have lowered this neckline by a half inch. That half inch seam allowance, I just simply forgot. <sighs> Alas, I can't ever film one of these and not make a mistake somewhere along the way. But up here again, if you were going to do this with a facing, you would go ahead and lay a piece of paper on here and trace a two and a half inch facing up here at this point before you switch and move the dart fullness. Here I am just cutting off some excess. We can work here. Just cut the rest of this out. I'm not going to modify anything else on this pattern except for the moving the dart into the neckline. So that all can get out of my way for now. And so I'm going to cut up the dart leg down here at the waist to the apex. Just make sure I'm in as best focus I can up to the apex here. And then these lines we drew up into the neckline, I will cut down from those again to the apex, not all the way through so that this can hinge open. It's not a big deal if you cut all the way through. It's just easier if you can leave yourself a tiny bit of a paper hinge there. All right, so of course, when I close this dart down here, bloop, along the waist, that fullness gets opened up into the neckline instead. It's the same dart, it's just in a new place. And it results in the exact same fit. The fit of the bodice does not change at all by moving this dart up here into the neckline instead. Now you can use this fullness that is opened up up here as darts or as pleats or tucks if you should so desire. But today I'm going to be using it as gathering. So I'm just going to be kind of interspersing this over this area here, taping everything back down and then smoothing off the top of this. But yes, if you wanted to split these perfectly even up here and have three darts on either side of the center front on your neckline, you could as well. Having a darted neckline is also an option. I'm just going to go ahead and smooth this off here. You can see I lose a little bit of the tips of those um, where the neckline used to be, but that is okay. It will not matter in the end. So I'm just going to smooth this off like so. Perfect. So here's my front piece now, and all of this, of course, will be gathered, and you can see how it fits back into the original neckline shape. Um, you won't want to keep your block around or your facing pattern or have a general idea of how big that neckline is supposed to be, and you'll see that later when I am gathering this neckline. So again, how did we get here? We have our regular bodice front, just a sloper style bodice front with two darts. One of those darts gets opened up into the sleeve to create the all-in-one bodice front, and then the waist start here for this particular pattern gets closed and opened up to the neckline. So that's where all of our darts have gone. And I'm going to use the standard all-in-one bodice back 
pattern here, just a tracing of that, so I'm not doing anything at all to the back. And for the skirt for this, I'm just going to use my A-line skirt, which again, I have made here on the channel, so I'll put a card up to the A-line skirt video here as well. So now that my pattern is all ready to go, of course, very simple modification today, just working on that front a little bit. And the nice thing about this pattern is it goes together quite quickly because the A-line skirt has no darts. So that is, you know, just the three pieces, the center, the front cut on the center fold, and then the two backs, and then the front of this has no darts, just has the gathering, so there's no darts to sew there. So the only darts to sew on this project are the darts on the back bodice pieces. So this all goes together quite quickly. But here I have my front piece. I'm going putting a pin to where the gathering starts and ends on each side so I know where to gather in between. And then I can go ahead and mark my darts here on the back pieces. Like I was saying, the only darts I have to do today. Again, I'm grabbing a colored pencil to do that real fast. Just seeing how my bugs lined up here. I wasn't really paying close attention to um, the matching of the print in any way with this because the Bugs are arranged kind of in a diagonal, but it's all very off kilter anyway, so I wasn't worried about it. And even in the repeat of the fabric itself, there are bugs that are the same that are like right next to each other. So if that happened because of the way I cut it out, it didn't really matter either because the pattern already had that. So here I've just marked my darts in and I can go ahead and just use three or four pins usually to close those up. And I'm just making sure where I poke through on one side, it matches up with the other. Pin my darts and set them next to the machine. And then for my skirt again for this, there are no darts or anything, so I can just go ahead and lay the front and two back pieces next to my serger because I will want to serge the side seams in the waist of this um, just to protect those raw edges, no other reason. That's what I use my serger for here. I don't ever use my serger to sew anything together. I only ever use it to encase my raw edges of fabric um, as a way of seam finishing, I suppose. You could of course use round seam binding, um, zigzag stitch, just cut things out with pinking shears, other ways to finish raw edges but because I have the serger here, that's what I usually use. And here I am using a scrap piece of fabric here and I'm cutting two inch wide strips on the 45 degree angle to create bias strips, bias tape that I can use for both finishing the neckline of this garment, hemming the sleeves of this garment, and then hemming the dress itself as well. So just cutting myself some bias tape. You can make those strips longer by sewing them together like so, but this is a nice lightweight poplin fabric. So I wanted to use self fabric bias tape because um, like store-bought bias tape double fold would be t uh, much heavier than this fabric is and therefore the difference in weight would create a bit of a problem. Um, so it was nice to be using the exact same weight of fabric because it is exactly the same fabric. And here I am sewing my darts into those back pieces as well. And then I will serge the raw edges of these two. Um, the only edges I don't run through the serger normally on a project like this would be the neckline edge because it's either going to be encased in a facing or in this case in bias binding. So not worried about that raw edge because it will be encased anyhow and I wouldn't want to add any extra bulk by surging it as well when I didn't have to. Again, as usual, I'm just starting at the large end of the dart, sewing along the mark I have there off the tip of the point and then tying my threads shut at the point and leaving about an inch of thread there when I trim them down. Just gonna go ahead and press those darts and give my pieces actually a quick press while I'm over here. This poplin fabric is a little bit uh, it like wants to look a little bit rumpled and wrinkled all the time, which is fine, especially for like a summer garment, that it just has a little bit of a texture to it, which is fine. I don't mind. It's not, I mean, I could get it crisp. If I like used starch or something, I'd get it perfectly crisp, but I'm not that, that worried about it, you know? So I'm just giving these a press and setting them next to my serger. Even the backside of this, I think is fun. This fabric actually did come in several colorways from Mood, and I have a yard of the white background version of it as well that I would like to make one of my little wrap back tops out of sometime to wear with like black or blue or any color skirt, honestly. And then it came in like a red color, but when the, I actually ordered the red color first, but when it arrived, it's actually a very coral pink color of red that I don't think will work my skin tone. So I'm gonna have a few yards of this fabric in red <laughs> that I'm going to be reselling on my Etsy shop soon. So uh, if you'd like this fabric with kind of a pinkish red background and you don't want to buy it from Mood, which it may not be in stock anymore, actually, I will have some available soon. Um, so one lucky person will be able to snap that up. I am going to have a little bit, a few um, random yards of fabric that I've decided that I won't be using from my stash will be going into the Etsy sale here soon, which is what I've been working on uh, kind of in my off time. <laughs> um, the rest of my time has been spent sorting, uh, mending, photographing, 
editing the photos and listing things for the Etsy sale finally, because of course I did have that closet clear out earlier in the year. And so a lot of things are going to be going into my Etsy shop for a kind of closet clear out sale. And then I do have some things that will be going into my Etsy shop that I, uh, that's like vintage that I purchased for the shop exclusively um, before COVID even happened. So like last February. And um, so there are things that are not my size actually going to the shop as well, but most of it, most of this big restock I'm about to do, and I will announce this on the community page and on my Instagram as well, when that goes live um, is going to be stuff that is my size. And I am sorry about that, but it's because I'm cleaning out my closet. But here I am just putting the gathering stitching along the front of the bodice here. I'm just using the presser foot as a guide to put in two lines of basting length stitching. This is the largest stitch length on my machine all along the front here so that I can gather this down to the correct size and we can have our gathering along the neckline. Before that though, I'm going to come back over here on the ironing board and give again my skirt pieces a quick press and then I can sew them together at the side seams. Now that everything is surged as you can see. Again, I don't bother to surge the hem either because the hem will be encased in bias tape later as well because we all know if it's an A-line, if it's a curved hem of any kind, I like to finish those with bias. If you ever try, if you try one thing that I show here on my channel that you give a shot, go ahead and try hemming something curved with bias. I doubt you'll go back. It is too, uh, so much easier than trying to turn a curved edge twice or any other hem method, I think. Hemming with bias. I, uh, I evangelize about it quite a lot, as we know. But here I'm just pinning my side seams for the skirt so I can sew them together. While I'm here, I will go ahead and pin my shoulder seams of the bodice as well, so my front and back here. Just going to uh, put all this together before I even gather down that front, but I have my gathering stitching in there already because it's easier to do it while everything is flat like this. But here I'm going to pin my underarm slash side seam as well. And for this, I'm going to try and explain how I do these now. Um, a lot of the times I try and sew this with a half inch seam allowance everywhere except this little curve. Right here for this little curve, I lower down to a quarter inch of a seam allowance just along this curve here so that I don't have to clip it. I mean, it still would lay even flatter if I did clip it, but you don't actually, you can get away with not clipping that if you leave it or narrow down to a quarter inch seam allowance just over that curved area. So hopefully you see what I mean here as I'm about to do that. Uh, down here at the waistline, you can see this dart. This You can see kind of where I am because of the dart here. Down at the waist and along the side seam, I want to maintain a half inch seam allowance, but right here at this curve, I just narrow down manually here on the machine to a quarter inch seam allowance. So hopefully you understand what I mean. Most of this is sewn at the half inch, do 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 do, and then I just narrow down to a quarter inch right around this curve. And I'm actually going to put a extra little line of stitching right on top of my first line of stitching right here at the curve again, just for extra reinforcement in this area because it does get a lot of stress being right under the arm. But yes, I've been working on the Etsy shop, Etsy shop restock um, quite a lot lately. For it's taking several days, of course, um, because I, and I knew it would be a huge project, which is why. I haven't had time up until now. And honestly, I don't really have time to do that now either, but it doesn't matter. It has to be done. And I, I'm gonna feel so good to have that area that has been dominated by stuff that needs to be listed on Etsy cleared out and clean. And I need to finish a painting of a cabinetry project that's actually sitting down here in the basement as well, kind of off screen. I have this project that I started again, like last February to repaint the like vanity cabinets of my bathroom. And then I realized how annoying it is to sand cabinet doors. And so I've been on pause for a long time with that project and I really need to finish that as well. So hopefully I'll have time for that after this big Etsy project. Ooh, we will see. I really need to get on that. It will look nicer and I'm just tired. I've had my cabinetry in my bathroom just open to the elements <clears throat> or to dust really for the last like year because I haven't finished those cabinet doors. So I really, really need to get on that because it will look nicer. And I will also like not have to stare at the mess under my sinks all the time, which would be nice. Here I am just pressing my seams open now that they are sewn by the way, including the shoulder seam. Like so, always press your seams open for a nice finish in life. All right, so now I can go ahead and gather down this neckline and you'll see me uh, reference my block pattern because the neckline is unchanged here. Again, I should have lowered it at the half inch, but because I didn't, Technically, I can reference my block pattern to make sure this neckline is the correct size. But a better idea would be to um, lower your pattern that half inch like I spoke of along here, which I did not do. So this is fine, technically, except for that I should have lowered this half inch. Anyway, um, and measure your pattern. So measure your pattern 
with that half inch removed on your actual pattern that you make for this before you move the fullness up in there. Again, hopefully you know what I mean. Basically you want this to, once you gather it down to um, measure the same as the neckline was before you distorted it by opening that dart fullness into it. Goodness. As always, we have run into the part of the video where I'm like, I might as well be speaking some sort of language from Star Wars because nothing I say is making any sense. But you can see I'm just referencing the neckline of my original block to make sure this is of a similar size, which it is, in which case, uh, in this case actually, which means it's too small <laughs> because I didn't cut that darn seam allowance off. Hopefully you're following along with what I mean by that. Anyway, once I have this to be the right size, I'm pulling my threads onto the surface and tying them off so that I can move and like zhuzh this gathering around without worrying about the gathering itself being pulled out. And I'll do that the same way on each side here. I hope all of you are doing well so far as we enter summer here, or at least in my neck of the world, <laughs> neck of the woods, we are entering summer. It's very hot out. It was actually 98 degrees the other day. And I was like, that is in fact too warm. Um, so a nice lightweight summer dress like this will definitely come in handy in the environment around me because it does get quite warm here in the summertime even if it does, you know, snow. Uh, we don't really have all four seasons here in Colorado. The thing about Colorado is you can have all four seasons in one day, but usually we don't have a very long fall or a long spring. They're usually quite short here. Um, it'll like snow all the way into the transition to summer. It'll be like snowing one week and the next week it'll be 80 degrees. <laughs> That's how May works here. And then sometimes it'll be quite hot all the way into October and then on Halloween it will snow. So, you know, we're kind of used to not having the full range of seasons. But then again, it will sometimes like you'll wake up, everything will be clear, a huge thunderstorm will roll in, it will like get cold and windy and hail, and then by afternoon it will have like rolled out again and it'll have like a nice like 78 summer <laughs> afternoon after that. So, Colorado, it's a strange place. Here I am just going ahead now that I have the neckline sized the way I want to and the gathering moved around so it's even, not too bunched up in one area or another. I'm just pinning on some bias tape, right sides together, along that neckline to bind that neckline edge. So I will go ahead and sew this on by machine over here. And of course, for some reason, my camera decided to not record this. So here I am miming it for you. Here we go. You just, you would feed it through the machine like this. Make sure your gathering isn't getting bunched up naughtily and everything's staying smooth. Just imagine I'm actually sewing. You get the idea. Oh, like so. Yeah, magic. Ugh, oh, darn you, camera. Really? But once that is sewn onto the outside, you can fold the double fold bias tape down cleanly onto the inside, like so, and then hand stitch this down. You could um, make sure it's like folded over the original stitch line and like stitch in the ditch or do some sort of top stitching on the outside to hold this inside in, but I think it's nice to finish it cleanly by hand stitching this down along the inside of the neck edge. So just pinning this all down smoothly on the inside so that I can hand sew it down. So I'm again just going to take a doubled thread on a needle here with a knot on the end. I'm not ashamed. And I'm just going to take a small stitch out of the folded edge of the bias that I have folded inside here and then a small stitch um, right above the stitching line from sewing the bias onto the front. Hopefully you can see what I mean. I know this is very small detailed nonsense, but if I zoom in anymore, it just gets blurry anyway. So the camera is not quite up to the task. In fact, this camera hates this shade of blue. I don't know what that's about. Um, this is a Nikon 3200, I think it's called. Um, it's an older camera. It's from 2013, um, which is not that old, but it's not top of the line anymore. That's for sure. Um, and it does not like mid tones of blue or like blue in general, honestly. And when I filmed the Ravenclaw lookbook back in the day when I was doing that, it was really irritating because my backdrop was painted kind of a mid-toned blue and it distorted every other color that I put in front of that camera. So whatever the white balance on the manual mode of this thing was, it's a no. So the fact that any, like right now, the blue looks quite accurate. The fact that this ever looked the right color at all, uh, is kind of surprising, honestly, because my camera in this color, not fans of one another. But here I am using more bias tape to go ahead and hem my sleeves. So I'm going to go ahead again, pin this along the outside edge like so, and I will sew this on with half inch seam allowance. And then again, I will turn all this to the inside and hem my sleeves. You could bind your sleeves too, but I'm just gonna turn this all the way in and hem them. But just going all the way around, making sure my bias strip is long enough to do each sleeve here. 
these sleeves you definitely could just um, turn them twice because it is um, like a straight there's enough room to do so I should, I should say I guess at the underarm and the top it's a straight seam so you could just turn this twice and hem it as well but just because I was hemming everything else with bias tape I figured why the heck not just finish it this way it'll be a nice clean finish but here I am stitching that on as well over here at the machine and I am using my fine silk pens here so I have no trouble or no uh, fear sewing right over them as we know unless you're new here hello yes as I always say every time I sew over my pins. And actually, those of you who are paying quite close attention here will notice that my thread does not match this fabric perfectly. I didn't have this exact color blue in stock, but I wanted to make this dress. So I just chose what I had that was most similar, um, which was fine for almost everything except for when it comes to like hand hemming the sleeves like I'm about to do and also the hem of the dress, which I do in this exact same way, sewing on the bias tape and then hand stitching the folded edge down with like a long stitch into the bias fold, a short stitch into the garment which you will see here in just a moment. I show it for this sleeve hemming, but I don't bother to show it for the hem of the dress itself because how much hemming do we need to watch me do? It's hard to say, you know? But here I am just folding everything down and my camera's about to cut out in three, two, one. Anyway, here I am. Now I have again a needle and thread. My thread is again doubled. And again, I'm taking a longer stitch out or into the folded edge of this bias, a tiny stitch into the project a longer stitch into the fold, a small stitch into the project. Once, uh, over and over and over and over again, basically. This is how I hem most things in life, whether I'm using bias or just folding things up. This is my most common, I don't know, hand stitch I use for hemming. It looks like this on the other side. Again, if your thread matched, that would be quite invisible. But of course my thread is too light for this project as previously mentioned. But it was either like a little bit too light or like dark navy blue and i went with a little bit too light all right so finish off my sleeves like so and they look like this when they were all done again you can see those hand stitches there but again if someone's bothered by that then um really 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 you're too close to me probably let's be honest all right so again just pressing my seams including this side seam of my skirt pieces here get back to my skirt for a second hey <laughs> so I had sewn the side seams, side seams of this skirt earlier, and now that they are pressed open, I can go ahead and sew the bodice and skirt together at the waist. So I'm just going to pin my side seams together first to make sure those match up, ease everything else together. It should match up perfectly, but, you know, strange things happen. So sometimes you have to ease this a little bit if one ends up a tiny bit larger than the other, thanks to things stretching or whatever. That's why, um, like, commercial patterns often tell you to stay stitch stuff so that none of that happens, but I've never had major problems with anything, so I don't mind. And here I am, again, half-inch seam allowance, sewing my bodice and skirt together along the waist. I do have a little bit of this fabric left over. Um, I'm thinking if I have a little bit left over of the white after making a blouse and still have some of this blue left over, I might be able to like uh, splice those two together to create some sort of Frankenstein quilted situation. Make another blouse that has both the blue and the white, perhaps, or something like that. So I'm keeping those aside. Of course, I could always just make a bunch of masks out of this because, you know, probably going to need some masks in my life moving forward, I anticipate. Anyway, here's the center back seam. Um, at the bottom, underneath where my zipper will end, I want to sew this together like so, with 5 8 seam allowance, because that's what I have on this particular tracing of this pattern for whatever reason. So I've gone ahead and sewn that together down here at the bottom of the skirt. I just like to sew the bottom underneath my zipper area together first before I put the zipper in. So I've just sewn that and pressed that open, and then I can go ahead and press the rest of this open. Um, sometimes you will see me do my lap zippers by sewing the entire back seam shut first, like basting this top part of the um, seam shut and then removing the basting stitching after I have pressed it open. The alternative to doing that is just to fold back each edge like this and um, press it in place without having to do that basting. Um, I kind of like go through phases where I prefer basting it shut and pressing it or just folding it and measuring like this. Currently I'm in a measuring fold back phase, you know? Those, that's just the way, the way of things. So I'm folding this all back 5 eighths of an inch with my hem gauge here. And I uh, will go ahead and put my zipper in. Also, I'm not going to put my zipper all the way up to the top of the neckline on this dress. I kind of want to leave a little bit of a, not necessarily a keyhole, but a like slit opening from the back neck to mid back. So you'll see that today as well. But now that I have all this edge pressed 
the way I want it, or measured at the way I want it, and pressed into a crisp little fold there. You can see the kind of wrinkly nature of this fabric that I was mentioning earlier, by the way. Whatever. It's okay. It can be slightly wrinkly. It's a easy summer dress. Anyway, I'm going to end my zipper here, mid-back. Funny enough. I'm just going to go ahead and pin that folded edge right along the zipper teeth, and I will sew this right along the zipper teeth for this side. This is, as I'm looking at the dress, the looking down at it, the right-hand side um, of the zipper, I suppose. And I'm going to go ahead and stitch this right next to those zipper teeth using my a zipper foot over on the machine. And your zipper foot may not look exactly like mine, because, of course, my machine is a is an oldie, but... Uh, <laughs> It, uh, same principle applies, no matter what your zipper foot looks like. And adjusted ready, slide the project on here, remove a couple of my pins, and I'm just going to uh, ride right along, like riding the metal of the presser foot right along the zipper teeth here, so that I can stitch about a millimeter away, pretty close, stitch that fold down to the zipper tape underneath. Like so, and once I get to the end of the zipper, I will go ahead and leave the needle down, pull the presser foot up, move the zipper pull out of the way, pull it down a little bit, put the presser foot back down, and just keep sewing the last little half inch or so of the zipper. Do some back stitching up here. All right, and then the other side, of course, I'm going to overlap because I like a lapped zipper, which is what I'm doing here. So I'm overlapping the other side. I like to pin the waist first so I can make sure that matches up perfectly. And then here you can see it's almost like it's stretched a little bit, so I'm using some steam to make sure everything fits down nicely the way it's supposed to. And then I will just overlap the other side here, slightly over that stitching, basically, that I used to stitch the other side down to the zipper tape. Again, hopefully this makes any sense. If you've ever seen me do a zipper before, I do it nearly the same way every time. Small modifications to my technique. You can do, you can put in your zippers whichever way you like, of course. You could do a railroaded zipper. You could do a side zipper in your dress, which, of course, I never use because I don't approve of side zippers. I don't like side zippers or pockets. Those are two things you will just never see me do. I'm sorry. It's just not for me. But here I am at the top here, just making sure this will overlap enough to cover that zipper pull. I wish they made zipper pulls smoother and flatter. Like, I wish there was a zipper out there that they just made the pulls lay less bulkily. I don't know. Let me know if you've ever used a nicer, very, like, lay flat zipper. Of course, there are invisible zippers out there, but in my experience, invisible zippers break much more than regular zippers do. And so I'd rather use a regular zipper. I'd rather use a metal zipper, honestly, but those are hard to find in every length and color. Unless you can find vintage ones, which is nice. Here I am using the other side of my zipper foot to stitch down this lap side of my zipper to the zipper tape underneath. Again, riding the zipper foot along the teeth of the zipper here by feel, as it were. Again, if you've seen me do a zipper before, you've seen me do this kind of mess before. We all must do what is right for us, of course, and this is how I prefer to do my zippers. Changes by the day. But here is the finished situation, like so. Again, wishing I had a thread that matched this blue perfectly, <laughs> because then you would see, wouldn't see the stitching back here as much. But what are you going to do? Alas. Anyway, the zipper is longer because I only put it up to the mid back as opposed to all the way up to the neckline. Um, and you could trim this off and like melt the ends of it or whatever. I'm just going to tack this down, so I'm going to grab, again, some double thread and just tack this end of the zipper down to the seam uh, allowance down here so that it just doesn't flop around inside my dress. Just tack that down real fast, like so. Then up here at the top, I need to make sure this is, again, still pressed all down nicely, open and flat, and I will put a hook and eye at the top, at the back of my neck up here, basically. I just want to make sure everything is pressed nicely and flat and pressed me pressed me, pressed me bias tape, press my biased tape um, in on itself so everything's nicely finished up here. And I'm actually just going to slip stitch this all down to itself inside of here. And then I will just use this pencil to mark where I want my hooks and eyes to go. And I can go and sit down and sew them in off camera. So sorry. I don't do my hooks and eyes particularly nicely. It's not like I do it the official way anyway. So you're not missing anything, I promise. But that's what the back of this looks like all finished. And then it was all that was left to do was the hem. And once again, I used bias tape that matched my, or like cut from my same fabric, and I've sewn it onto the outside, and here I am turning it on to the inside, pinning it down, and then I will again do that long and short stitch to hem this down with my little tiny stitches that will show on the front, and then uh, stitching into the fold along the bias tape, just like I hemmed the sleeves earlier. I'll be using the same technique to hem the hem of this dress. Hem the hem. You know what I mean. 
And that is it for this dress. It's actually quite simple to put together. An easy breezy summer dress completed. Here is my finished bug print lightweight cotton summer dress with this gathering up at the neckline. I just love this style. I've already actually made this almost exact same dress out of leftover IKEA duvet cover fabric, which you can see here. This is almost the exactly exactly the same dress. And I do believe I've shown a couple of blouses here on the channel that I've made with the same modification before. I do use this quite a lot. I really like this style. It's um I don't know, it's I, I usually I'm not a big fan of gathering. I usually like the smooth finish of a dart instead. But gathering up the neckline, I think it's like a nice feminine detail for whatever reason. And it definitely helps with the hourglass silhouette again on something like this, where it has that stronger shoulder still because of the all-in-one sleeve and the like crispness of the cotton help helping to hold that all-in-one sleeve out like that. Thank you as always for watching this video today, and I'll be back here with more sewing in vintage fashion real soon. Bye. <laughs>